ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever. So, hi, Alex Gertzberg. Hi, Molly Gabler. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm a little sick. Yeah. yeah I've been running a fever for the last couple of days. And anything other than that? Uh, got a little little sore throat. Happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming. <clears throat> But, um, That's how it starts. The little sore throat. The sore throat will go away tomorrow and the next day. How long has this been? I can pinpoint it exactly because young Ethan and I went boating on Saturday afternoon. Okay. And um, we went to the east bank of the flats and had lunch at Punch Bowl Social. Oh, I was just there yesterday. Were you? Mm-hmm. Was there a giant line? No, no, we have reservations. Oh, see, I wasn't smart enough to yeah. do that. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's the, it was the weirdest thing. When we walked into Punch Bowl Social, I was perfectly fine. When I left, I was like, oh, that's weird. Where did all my energy go? And did your throat start hurting yeah. again? Yeah, and then, when, and then when we docked the boat afterwards, I was like, yep, I'm running a fever. I'm getting the chills. Yeah. So Tomorrow and the next day. Ugh, don't say that. You're going to feel like someone is laying on top of you. This assumes that I've got you. the same, like, it's ex- exactly herpes like it that started. you got. Exactly or like it had. started. Yes. <sighs> yeah. I mean, but I don't I don't um, make out with the same strippers as you do. So I, I, I mean, I think we probably do if you really run the line Maybe down. You're right. <laughs> So uh, how was your weekend, Molly Gebler? My weekend is great. I need to share something to the best podcast, if I could, about the best podcast ever. I got a phone call today from um, the Larry Morrow. Is that right? The legendary, the voice of Cleveland? Voice of Cleveland. And he just told me that he was so impressed with... I'm not kidding you. Um, So impressed with uh, the podcast and... He had signed, the minute he left, he just was so happy and in such a great mood, and he signed two books for us, and he's going to drop them off on Thursday at the chamber office. Wow. Um, and just was so pleased with the whole thing. So, and I got to, you know, I mean, that's that's a big compliment. He's legit. He knows. Yeah. He's interviewed presidents That's like before. That's like Michael Jordan saying he likes your jump shot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's Which money. will never happen. Right. But, um, so, our guest today... Yes, Molly Gebler. Is, Gettler. as you know, um, none other than you, Alex Kurtzberg. Alexander. <laughs> what? <laughs> Edward. Edward. I, I knew, I knew yeah. that because that's your dad's name. So far, this sounds like the most boring podcast ever. Oh, it's not. We should going change to the be. name to it's, boring. We're, no, because we're we're ever. not. I mean, everybody knows you're a lawyer, so we're really not going to dig deep into that because people know <clears> that. <throat> we're going to d- just dig into Alex, um, Ale- Alexander, Edward Gertzberg the first. <laughs> right. You want a glass of wine? No. Um, do you? No. Do you think that would loosen you up? Do you think no. I'd get some more shit, different no. stuff if, I, if you did? No, I, I wouldn't have one anyway. I have not had a glass of alcohol oh. since uh, for like a week now. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that's why you're sick. I'm st- could be. I gave up Diet Coke and that's why I got sick. <sighs> wouldn't mm, that be something? We might be I wonder something. if like... Um, Just the you, change of your body. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. I would think my immune system would improve though. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. So... Obviously, well accomplished in the law. Um, Not accurate. It's totally true. Um, and when I say accomplished, I say um, you were a super lawyer, 2015 to 2017. Um, Crane's business, 40 under 40 in 2012. You're a cozy expert. Um, 10.0 superb AVVO ratings. I'm sure those are really important things. <laughs> But I don't know much of that. Client's Choice. I like that award. Thank you. Chosen by the clients. I love that award. Service. Client's Service Award. Mm. Love that. Love. Uh, and that's not just one time. 2013 through 2016. Clients dig us. And I'm going to assume that 17 hasn't been reported yet. I think that's true. Yes. Um, so obviously, lots of awards. You're you know what, Molly? A brilliant brilliant attorney you are the official 
attorney of the pumpkin roll documentary. Um, Up for an Oscar this year. Uh, knock on cheap wood, which isn't even wood. Um, this but is a great conference table. We're going to dive into other things. What, 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 your those, your free way, time. All of those, by the way, are totally meaningless um, in relation to my not winning the Chamber Business of the Year. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary <laughs> Quinn Ponce, Marianne. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. She... Uh, uh, I got my eye on her, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. mean, I hope that she watches her back. Uh, I know she was a podcast guest. Yeah, uh, I know you're listening right now, Marianne. Uh, but uh, you better watch it because if I see you you're walking coming down after the alley, next year. right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, no. Wow. You know, she totally deserved it. That document film festival. The yeah. what is it? The chagrin documentary, documentary film, film festival. festival. Yes. Definitely well, it's funny. Boy. Awards are important to you because that is kind of how this podcast started. Um, was when we well we talked about amazing things mm. that are amazing, and that was on your list. I recall um, a shelf of awards or recognition for your work was no, under your I know amazingness. What you're th- I know what you're thinking. That, no, that's what exactly you're, what I'm thinking. What you're no, what you're thinking is that. Um, we have a strategic plan in the, at the law firm, and that plan has different components to it. One being, I'll, I'll give you two of them, and the other two are totally confidential. One, is, though, is um, client facing, and one is employee facing. And in each case, um, there's an award. And so the client facing, we call them our B hags. You know what a B hag is? No. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Okay. Right? So I'm going to give you two of the four BHAGs of the Gertzberg Law Firm. Okay. One is that we will win an award by some reputable organization or publication for having the best client service in Northeast Ohio. But you did that already. No, we didn't. I just read that. Oh, but that's, that's AVO. Okay. No, yeah, that's um, not important enough? No, it is. It's just AVO is more like an online. They gave us that award because people kept writing nice things on our, um, that's on our how, that's rating how us you high. Get we got a high rating. Right. No, I'm talking about like within this community, right? I see. Um, so we're headed back to the Chamber uh, Award again, are we? Well, <laughs> even that. As great an award as it service. is, it's not, cl- yeah, right. It's not client, client service. Client service. Right. Th- so Cleveland 99 has a client service award, I think. Um, I think there are a few other organizations in Cleveland that have that, but that's important to me. And then similarly, another BHAG is that we intend to win an award given by some reputable organization or publication for being the best place to work in Northeast Ohio. Mm. And what's um, interesting about, to me anyway, about those two awards is that striving for them means that you have to have built, whether you win or not, you have to have built a good client service organization or a good employee um, place to work, right? A good home for the employees. I always, I think I've said this to you, Molly. I, um, having worn both hats in my career, the outside counsel hat and the in-house counsel hat, um, decided that when I started this law firm, I wanted to build the law firm I used to want to work for and the law firm I used to want to hire. So that's the move. That's the plan. With all that being said, that's not why when we talked about starting the podcast were you just falling asleep with your eyes open <laughs> as i no, was talking those are great things but uh, you know awards are that was one of your um you you recognized amazingness by people that received a lot of awards i did yeah that was one of your that and and um i believe a paycheck was another one like just you know having a being paid for your work in a big way was another amazing when we were looking you know it doesn't matter yeah no i i think i know what you're when we were looking at when we were discussing what amazing looks like right on your list some of the things were you know 
recognized by awards. They were? <laughs> yes, yes. I think I have that piece of paper. Anywho, point being that you have a lot of awards. <laughs> Take two, folks. But I don't want to dig into that because I think at our podcast, we talk a lot about your law. I want to dive into Alex, the person, the person, Alex. And I want to start with moving here from Russia. Ooh. Um, and I want to talk, really dive into that because there was, uh, in, the, in the paperwork you provided, uh, the best podcast ever. I provided um, no paperwork. That's not true. No, it's true. Totally um, true. Nellie didn't bounce any of that off of me. Oh. Did she Did she pretend well, that Well, then I it's did? coming from somewhere because she didn't make this stuff up. There was definitely a huge sense of not fitting in. Yeah. You know um, where that's from? Your book. Yeah. It, so I was, I've, I've been working on this book, and that's a, an excerpt from it, which I put into, um, they, get, they gave me an immigrant award. There's another award, another folks. Award, yeah. Um, so but let's, so let's yeah. go back. So let's talk about moving here. Yeah. All you right. were how old? Four years old. Okay. Um, do you know where Moldova is? I don't. It's uh, in Russia. Yeah. No. Uh, no. It's, it's neighbor. In... It, it's sort of close to Russia and to the Ukraine and Romania. Okay. So it's in that area of Eastern Europe. It's in the western part of Eastern Europe. Right before you get into like, if you keep going west, it's like Romania and Poland and Hungary and all that stuff. Okay. But this is still in the eastern part. And uh, yeah, I came over. I was four. You know. So yeah. why did you guys come over? Like, was it yeah. th what everyone thinks about? We need to go to America to have the dream and live the dream, and it's just a better place. Was that? So it was inhospitable to Jews. That was one reason. And it was not a very promising place to uh, imagine your future, if you whether you were Jewish or not. And what was your dad or, or mom if she worked? Yeah. Like, what were they doing at that point? My mom was a bookkeeper, and my dad was a cabinet maker. Okay. Or an architect. I forget which. Okay. So, might have been both. <laughs> he might have been doing architecture so one day they yeah. they got so together and down. said no here's how it went down right so it, it, there, there's these two giant waves of jews coming out of the soviet union one is in 79 and one is in the late 80s in 79 for whatever reason the doors kind of open up and you're allowed to leave right and um so i'm four years old and a bunch of relatives all decide you know we're we're getting out of here so the original plan was to go to Israel, and my family, uh, from my dad backward, is very religious. I'm not very religious. I'm not religious at all, but my dad and his parents were religious. And so um, uh, he's 25 years old at this time, the old man, right? And uh, they're planning to go to Israel. With, one child you're the only yeah, one at, at this time point. i'm the only uh, i'm only the only kid and so his whole family so his mother his sister his aunts and uncles his cousins they're all going to israel now my mom's side of the family is all coming to america so there's this schism in the family this rift and is that what schism means yeah um, is that a jewish term no <laughs> <laughs> Might, maybe it is i don't know uh um it's uh so anyway you haven't heard of the Great Schism? It was. Uh, Is it a book? <laughs> no, but like the, the most common, um, the the most common use of the Great Schism, I think, is when the two popes went their own way, mm. back uh, when the Catholic Church split off from the Anglican Church, mm -hmm. you know, or the Eastern Orthodox. I forget. Anyway, that's your history lesson, kids, yes. for the day. We've had geography so right. far and we can, history. We can only screw up your education. Uh, all right. So anyway, so my mom is an identical twin sister. Her twin is about to go to the U.S. My mom and my dad are about to go to Israel. They go to, I believe it's Vienna, Austria, right, with me in tow. And, sl and slowly they start saying goodbye to each other. And they're really, really close. Identical twins. Very, very right. close. 
And so my aunt and her family all go to the U.S. and they hug each other goodbye. My mom loses her mind. She's like, I don't know. Because at that time, I mean, there's no cell phones or internet. Right. When you say goodbye in Austria, you have no clue if you'll ever see each other again. Mm -hmm. So they go, say goodbye, lots of tears, lots of sadness. Uh, my Aunt Luba moves to um, the U.S. and now it's me and my mom and my dad and they're all, and we're all getting ready to go to Israel. And my mom just loses her mind, right? And she gets like physically ill and is just kind of depressed and crying a lot. And uh, my dad's mother, right? So this is my grandmother, Anna, goes up to my dad and says, well, you can't separate your wife from her sister, right? And my dad's like, well, I'm not gonna leave you guys. You know, my dad's dad had died when he was 16. So my dad's been kind of raising his younger sister and looking out for his mother. And he's like, I'm, I'm not gonna let you guys go to Israel without me. Not only that, but if you didn't go to Israel when you left the Soviet Union, you were kind of looked on by the other Jews as kind of a traitor. Right. So there was a lot of I mean, you know about the Catholic guilt, right? Mm -hmm. The Jewish guilt is just oh, as bad, same, if not yeah. worse. Right. So it's it, it so got if you went to the United States. You would be kind of shunned. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, and, and my grandmother and my dad mentioned this to my grandma. And she's like, don't worry about any of that. You got to go take care of your wife because she's going to come to Israel and she's going to be miserable. She's going to make you miserable. She's going to make everyone's going to cool be a lady to, yeah. to notice that. So. At the last minute, my dad says, no, we're not going to Israel. Thank God, because I'd love, you know, Israel's a great place, but I couldn't I never, imagine. Never know you. Yeah. I never know I, you. This podcast wouldn't even, no, even happen. No, no. So we come to America, and... Um, Did grandma and sister They stay? all went to Israel. Oh, I mean, and for the first, like, 10 years after that, I would go, we would go to Israel every other year. Mm. So I've been to Israel, like, seven times. And, um, yeah, I mean... God love him. I, I, I thank God every day that wow. my dad made that call. Yeah. You know? Wow. Um, and yeah, then. That'd be a tough call to have to just. Oh, yeah. To choose between your wife and your mother. Well, and. In the role that he was playing in right. that family. And they were really tight, too. And he was really close with his sister. So when he said goodbye to them now, it was the same thing. He right. didn't know if he was ever going to see his mom again or his sister again. And his sister at that time was like 18. You know, wow. and did she stay? Yeah. So they've all lived in Israel ever since. Okay. But technology and communication being what it is, we've always been able to stay close okay. since then. And is grandma still? Yeah, alive she's alive. And, okay. and at the time, I had a great grandma who went over there, too. Um, and um, she passed away a few years ago. But anyway, um, it was, it was one of those like stories of my childhood that is like really, um, you know, it's like like the butterfly effect, you know, like one little one decision, decision over here affect you for the rest of your life. And that's what that's we try to tell one. our children when they any decision you make. Right. It's it, it could be life changing. Right. And and who knows the lives that your dad touched and you've touched and, yeah. and your sister has touched here and your mom here in the United States. Right. What. Like you're saying, that ripple effect, what that would not yeah. be if, if you guys weren't here. Yeah, no, it, it, it couldn't possibly be more different. So you were grateful that um, that choice was made, but yeah. n now, not so much. I mean, you yeah. were when you were younger, but there's a lot of conversation in my paperwork that yeah. I received um, of you just feeling different. Yeah. So here's how it goes down when you're an immigrant in the 70s, um, in the early 80s, right? So I kind of think of this that 70s show. Um, that is how we dressed. That kid. Well, except, that except into the 90s. <laughs> he had the accent and. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was I that dude's name? I don't remember his name, but. Oh, he was hilarious. That's what I think. So you are four um, years old. Yeah. So um, I went to school in. Um, I went to Coventry elementary school which is no longer a school right okay it's just a park now and i forget and my parents um told the school district that i lived in cleveland heights not east cleveland okay. because they had heard that if you send your kids to the east cleveland schools it was not going to be good for them mm. right 
And at that time, they were all still very Jewish, right? Um, and I guess they still are. But I, th- that whole... What ha- all right, so what happens is you get brought over by Jewish Family Services. They give you some money. They find you a job. Um, they put you in an apartment. And the um, payback to them is that you've got to, like, go to temple and be bar mitzvahed and give back to the Jewish community when you make some money and all that stuff, right? So there's some reciprocity there. Um, so through that community – they somehow, my parents somehow believe that Cleveland Heights is the way to go to be a nice Jewish kid, not East Cleveland, right? Gotcha. So again, a brilliant decision on your. Parents. Well, I don't know. Public uh, school is public. I mean, now looking back, I don't know. Public school is public school to me, but, um, but whatever. So, um, they wrote down on their application that we lived in my uncle's house, which was right behind Coventry School. My uncle, Alex Conrad, recently passed away. He was the one that I was writing the book about. Okay. He was the one that p- pulled us out of Russia, right? Okay. So this is your s- this twin is, sister's husband? No, no. This is my mother's uncle. It's okay. her mom's is brother. She, is that her maiden name, Conrad? No, he changed his name oh. because he had defected from the Soviet army. Oh. Yeah. Here, let me tell you that story really quick, okay? So in the 40s, he was in the Soviet army, and he defected after the, at the end of World War II and came to the United States, and he eventually became a professor at Case of Russian studies. Um, his entire life, he was convinced that the KGB was after him. He kept seeing people disappear right and they were all part of this group of soviet defectors and so he changed his name to conrad from gotcha. uh rosichner it might have been toy bear at one point but i forget but um so he in the early 70s started this secret um communication line back to the soviet union to locate his sister, my grandmother. They would talk at phone booths, right, Um, using, like, code words. This was in the the early 70s. And um, eventually he broke – despite having defected from the Soviet army and being convinced that he was being looked for by the KGB, convinced that if he would have been caught, he would have been uh, a traitor and shot, He nonetheless broke back into the Soviet Union under a different name to see his sister again. His sister, my grandmother at this time uh, in the 70s, is a tour guide in Russia. She took uh, business corporate groups around Russia on tours. He he hops on one of these tours with her, right? And um, they are traveling together. And at some point, he decides, I'm going to get her and her whole family out of Russia, which is how we got here. And there's this whole process at that time. You have to vouch for the people and you have to uh, that you're pulling out of there and you have to um, make these representations to the government that they're not going to be, you know, welfare cases. And he did all of that for us. Um, So anyway, he was it was his house that my parents lied to the school board gotcha. about that we were living in. And uh, so I grew up sort of at his house and sort of in this sort of crappy apartment on Superior in East Cleveland. And Until uh, when? So I think it would have been in the, it was probably like three or four years. Um, and then we went to, so here's the path, right? The path of the of the Soviet Jew in the, in the 80s, okay. right? Is... Um, They put you into an apartment in East Cleveland or Cleveland Heights, and then your parents make a little money, and then you buy a house in South Euclid, right, which is just east of Cleveland Heights. Mm -hmm. And then you make a little more money, and then you move east of there to Lyndhurst, right, or maybe Beechwood. And then that's pretty much where you do high school, right? Maybe Solon if you did really well. And then eventually when you – 
get a career, right? And your kids grow up and they have careers. They then, they don't want anything to do with South Heath, Litter, Lindhurst. So they go even farther east, like me, to Chagrin Falls. Gotcha. And what did your parents do? So dad was definitely a cabinet maker. He started a business here. He went to uh, night school for business and for and to learn English uh, and then he eventually started uh, a company called Cabinet Elegance and they made kitchen cabinets custom made kitchen cabinets him and his partner Martin who still runs that business to this day I was going to say does he have any extra laying around because I'd really Mine. like to get my kitchen done I, I know some people <laughs> Molly um, and then mom they all went to night school for English classes and um uh, mom's I remember her job was um, lampshades right like you had to take whatever job they give you and so she she made lampshades and I remember as a kid like coming home and there'd be like lampshades everywhere <laughs> so okay. she made lampshades and then um, they uh, I don't know they just did odd jobs so you had lots of I mean you had cousins that came over with you did you guys all just hang around each other um mostly we yeah we grew up really close because of the yeah we all had the same problems you know the same challenges so yeah we were all very tight and you talk about um i think i've said it already not fitting in yeah. and i don't know if we've really gotten into that yet but um parties and um and, and what age are we talking at this i mean obviously four years old yeah. You're not talking four years old. So, well, so I would say, Molly, from grade school through like early junior high, it was very obvious that we were not like the other kids because um, our parents didn't speak the language or spoke it very broken like. And uh, our clothes were always jacked up. I, I remember to this day, there were there were like they were like triple hand me downs, you know, like whoever we got them from, got them from two other people, you know. And but do you appreciate it now? Like, oh yeah, there's got to be a sense of appreciation yeah. at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you make sure you're well put together then? <laughs> no, <laughs> if anything, if anything, I'm more of a slob. I don't know if it's because of that. Um, but that, and it was just like, um, I don't know. I, I, I was always very aware that we were just different, you know? And, uh, I, like, I can't say that it affected us. I, like, I don't know how it changed anything at the time. You know, I, I definitely relied on my older cousin a lot because he, um, seemed to fit in more, right? And he always looked out for me. Um, but now, looking back, I think a lot about how um, some of the unconscious things that I think about um, are kind of related to wanting to fit in. Well, de you know? definitely. I mean, I know that you've mentioned several times on the podcast before how um, you concern yourself maybe too much on yeah. what other people think. Yes. And I yeah. definitely, when I was reading through that, that definitely hit me yeah. with being one of those things where, well, now I understand where that comes from. Yeah, and, and, and I actually think about that a lot now in a, in, in a different way because I think that at some point, it became like, well, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. I was going to ask, did know? it give you drive? Yeah. So I, but the problem is it wasn't ever really consistent, right? So um, there was definitely, as a kid, this over-concern with how other people thought about me, about my parents. And then there was this trigger at some point where, and I think it benefited me more than anything else, creatively, Right where it was like, no, I want to, I really, I think breaking the rules is important, you know? Um, but then it would swing back sometimes and it would go back and forth. What do you mean breaking the rules is? Well, like in business, 
breaking the rules is kind of important in many ways. In innovation is important if you want to succeed in business. Um, but it's not it, – in something that is highly regulated, like the practice of law, it's it would be a bad thing. Right. Right? Or um, – there's just there's there's a time to break convention and there's a time when it's not a good idea. Let's talk a little bit about that because I'm a huge rule follower. So I you are not a huge rule. Follower. I'm a huge rule follower. You are? Oh yes. Really? Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. that's true. No. Why do you think that? Um, because I follow the rules a lot. <laughs> yeah, but you are. Um, I think out of the box, but yeah. I but I'm a, I follow the rules. Like I'm that one that says, oh, we really shouldn't do that because. It's it's not. Well, here, let me throw this back at you. <laughs> but I want to ask you with that thought when you because I, I find it intriguing to people who are the rebels and do break the rules. Um, when when someone's breaking the rules, as you say, are you conscious of other people when you're breaking those rules? Like, do you think of other people who might be affected or? interrupted by that breaking of the rule? Like, does that come into play when you're deciding whether or not this is going to be something I'm going to break the rules on? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I th- totally a legit, yeah. like, I totally well, want here, to know I think that the, question. The answer to that is it, it would depend, my answer would depend on which part of my life we were talking about. Because there were definite times, I mean, I will be honest with you, Molly, there was a period in my life when I was totally out of control, and I was a, a giant delinquent. Let's right? talk about that. Well, so in college, um, I think that, well, here, so I'll tell you this, and this this will um, this will um, tell you how much times, how many times I got in trouble in college. The judge in area one court was named judge patricia oni we used to call her the one and oni and patricia oni at one point in my junior year said to me i think i was there i was in front of her for like a like this is drinking in public miami of ohio okay she said mr gertzberg if i see you in my courtroom again you're gonna have to bring a toothbrush with you right and because i i was cycling through there quite a bit Six years later, I was in there as a lawyer, and I brought a toothbrush with me, and I gave it to her, <laughs> and she totally remembered. Um, so, yeah. the trouble teens started in college. No, definitely not. They started in high school. Okay. Um, and then college is like you know, it's a way, free for all. Yeah, it's a total free for free for all. Um, and then things calmed way down after. Well, then I went to I went to the army, and that helped a lot. Well, what do you think that was the the time where you started on that that journey to be an adult? Yeah, I um, think it was the army, or was well, it before then? I think that I joined the army, so I, I got an I got an ROTC scholarship, and I think that a part of me did it because. Um, I knew how undisciplined I was hmm. afterwards and then in Iraq I definitely got a lot more disciplined you know when I was in charge of a unit um, when I was when I was a, a commander of a unit I was a lot more disciplined after college did you go oh you ROTC did you get into that because your parents you know how they always say that the bad boys go to the military school or they get when you're lost and you need to find yourself, yeah. they head into the army or the the military. Is that why you I, were in there? So I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, and my dad said that's a horrible idea. Don't do that. And I think that um, uh, when I applied for the ROTC scholarship, um, he knew that I was just going to go my own way regardless. And he saw that it was going to be a bunch of money <laughs> right, to pay for college. He was like, well, that's not a bad idea. Um, and was he proud? I mean, this is an immigrant. This is. Yeah. Was he proud that you were fighting for the United States? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So he totally bought into the whole. I don't yeah. want to say bought in, but he became an American citizen in every in yes. every way. Yeah. Yeah. So off to um, 
graduated from college and then you go into the army? Is that how that works? So, because that this way, is not a good time. Uh, so it's the it's so it's I'm in Desert college Storm. '93 to '97. So Clinton is president, and. Um, it and was just actually, for the record, that's not why I said it's not a good time. Just so <laughs> I know you hate Clinton. We don't, I don't want to get any calls. <laughs> um, hate is a, I don't hate anything or anybody. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War was ninety two, so there should have been some indication that it was likely that I might go. Did you know you wanted to be an attorney at that point? Yeah. Okay, so you're taking uh, classes. Yeah. I have wanted to be a lawyer since I was like six. After a teacher. Sort of. It was after watching L.A. Law. Yes. I really wanted to be Arnie. Ar Arnie Becker. That's yes, right. I see I that. I thought he was the coolest dude. And that was, was that Corbin? Corbin Burnson, yeah. That's yeah. exactly who that was. Yeah. I kind of wanted to be Jimmy Smith's a little bit. Victor okay, Cifuentes, yeah. right? Yeah, but he was hotter. No, because he was the civil rights lawyer. Gotcha. Right? But... Um, I thought that um, Corbin Burnson was just like so smooth, you mm -hmm. know, in court. Mm -hmm. And I really always loved the idea of going into a courtroom and persuading 12 people to l go your way. I always thought that was such a cool thing. Um, and so a lot of um, – well, so anyway, so I – a lot of what I did between – then and like college was was with that in mind but then um i had this this geography teacher named mr welsh um who uh probably was the the teacher most influential on i think before i had him for geography in like eighth grade i always thought it was kind of just like this pipe dream but he really made it clear that if i wanted to be a lawyer i could be a lawyer and uh, he used to say, uh, he used to say, Gertzberg, you're either going to be in law school or jail. And, uh, and, then in, and then a few years after I graduated law school, I came, uh, I, I went back to Brush, Charles F. Brush High School, Molly. Yes. Uh, home of the Brush Arcs. Yes. Um, I went back to a football game over there, and he was tearing up tickets, right? He was collecting tickets and tearing them up. And I go... Mr. Welsh, remember when you said I'm only, I'm either going to law school or jail? And he goes, yeah. I go, well, the joke's on you because I've been to both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, well, was he proud? He was and very proud. And did you proud. tell him how influential he was? I did. I Good. did. That's kind I, of, I, I mean, mean something when yeah. uh, you make a – I mean, a te that's their whole purpose yeah. is to make a difference in a yeah. kid's life. and. That's kind of cool. Yeah. He's now the guy I think about when I think about, like, the next part of my life. And I think that it's probably going to involve teaching. Okay. And I And I – which is why our interview of your daughter w was so meaningful to me. Because I, I really think that um, if you're able to affect a kid in a positive way that way, right, um, you're impacting – their their entire world it, the, the the ripple out from them their families their coworkers um you know their communities i've always um appreciated the people that helped me along the way like mr welsh um i had uh, nelly and i had lunch with steve werber he's a professor former professor from uh from marshall I mean, that guy, you can draw a straight line from uh, that contracts class that I had him for to moot court to this essay contest that we, that you and I have done. You know, I mean, that guy was more responsible for how I practice law and how I wrote briefs and then how we made this contest. Um, but, and I remember too how important he said it was for him and for others to pay it forward. Um, so hi, Nelly Gertzberg. Hi, Nelly Gertzberg. Hi, everybody. Nelly Our Gertzberg producers just in the in. room, making sure we're on task and target. Came in here with a bull whip. Uh, again, we went from college, and do you then go off to 
to military or to so here the the short version is uh college was rotc and then it was so you have to do you have to give back is that how yeah, the you have ROTC to give them either give... four years of active duty or eight years of reserve duty okay right so after college uh they made me a, a second lieutenant um and a platoon leader for the um 762nd Transportation Company in Akron, Ohio. And home of LeBron James. Home of LeBron James. Do so, I... um, is that a choice you make on the four a- active or the eight? Like, do you yeah, get to so, make that choice? Um, I did make that choice, and um, I went with the eight years of reserve duty. Okay. And I went, and so they, I was a platoon leader for the 762nd. And so our, our whole mission was driving trucks, convo, truck convoys, flatbed trucks. And we did that all over America for a couple of years. And then in 2003, we got called up to go to Iraq. And um, I was in Iraq in 2003. At that point, I was already practicing law, you know. And then I came back from Iraq. So you were driving all these trucks at the same time that you were going to law school? Um, yes. No, because um, no, I got a deferral until after law school. That's right. Okay. Um, so, but I was driving trucks while I was practicing law. Okay. So once a month, you went down to Akron and did drills. And then... Um, so was it a bummer that you chose to do the eight years of reserve and then you end up being active anyways? No. No? Um, I mean, I wasn't, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't thrilled to go to Iraq. I know that's probably controversial to say that you're a soldier and you really wasn't sober excited. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. In my opinion, there's two types of of soldiers. There's one that um, gets involved because kind of your path, they want um, the money for college. Yeah. Um, They're not go hard I want to fight for my country type of diehard people. Yeah. Um, but then they get thrusted into it because that's what they agreed upon. And then there's the soldier who is the diehard yeah. fighting for your country <clears throat> and wants to go right into it. But you maybe thought that that eight years was going to be a driving trucks. So I... Although I think we established, sorry, that we were already in 92. We had already been there. Right. In 92 was the first Gulf War. In 03, it was the second Gulf War. Okay. Um, 03 was all because of 9-11, which was in 2001. I think my deal was I, I slowly became more and more of a pacifist. And I didn't think that we were going into Iraq for really noble reasons. And uh, but I was a leader. And I was a commissioned officer. And I'll never forget, you know, the, the day that we were deployed, like a bunch of moms came up to me and said, bring my, mm. bring my boy home in one piece, right? And that weighs very heavily on you as a leader, right? So I viewed my role in the Army, um, like I don't think that you have the luxury of agreeing with the, the reasons that your government sends you to war when you're in the Army. Um, if you did, I wouldn't have gone, Mm -hmm. but um, I was in charge of, you know, 40 soldiers in my platoon. When I was on a convoy, it was 160 soldiers on that convoy, and that is a grave responsibility. So that that's kind of how I saw my role there at that time. And can you give me a day, like a day there, like from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed in Iraq? Yeah. So. in the middle of our deployment, that would be because in the beginning it's all kind of weird and a little scary, and you don't know what you're doing. And then at the end, you're kind of just like on your way out. But so August 2003, right? Uh, you wake up and it's it's a five day mission. It's the same mission every week, right? Uh, our base was on the border of. It was called Camp Navstar, and it was on the border of Kuwait and Iraq. And our mission at that time, this is 
14 years ago. 14 years ago? That crazy yeah, to say that? Yeah, it is. Um, our mission was to drive a day. Now nah, it was probably half a day down to Camp Doha in Kuwait, load up with water and equipment and supplies and ammo and all this stuff, then go up to Baghdad, which is like three days, right? Um, and then drop it all off and then come back to Camp Navstar. And along the way, you stopped off at, to sleep at other bases along the way. And um, when I was there in 03, it was actually relatively safe because a lot of people don't remember this, but in 03, in the first year, they were the Iraqis were kind of happy to see us there, mm-hmm. right? Like, remember when, like, the Saddam statue came down mm-hmm. and... The war itself was, I think they called it like the 100-hour war or the 100-day war or something. It was like a short war, right? Um, It was during Ramadan, which was in uh, October-ish of 2003, that order, law and order, started to break down in Iraq because we had been there since February. um, And their electricity wasn't up and running and... Um, there was, when you're in Iraq and you're, and you don't have consistent electricity, that means you don't have air conditioning, right? That, that starts to affect, um, a lot of things, refrigeration, right? Um, people start losing their minds. So they were starting to get upset with the American soldiers for not moving us along and and taking care of them basically. Right. There was a lot of impatience. And another thing that happened, this was, this has been analyzed and reanalyzed ever since right the military made a decision at that time that they were going to strip all of the iraqi so army soldiers of their weapons and of their rank and just you're in the army today tomorrow you're out of a job right you've got to re-enlist and come back into the army and apply right what that did was it created a whole lot of unemployed people and in iraq that's a lot of very proud men who now have to get in line for a paycheck. And um, that wore thin after a while, too. And we didn't have the infrastructure set up to start uh, putting their economy back in place so that they would have jobs and, and so that they would start to bring you know, food on the table and keep the electricity going and keeping plumbing going and all that stuff. And so there was just kind of this breakdown of the society and of the economy that reached a boiling point at the end of 03. And that's when things got really shitty. After that, your job that was not very um, harmful at that time, now is when all the... um, IEDs. Right, those all start. Because that's the first thing I was thinking when you were talking about all these driving. So I, in in, in November... um, I got this skin disease when I was over there, right? Um, And went to, um, they they pulled me out of there and went to, uh, and I went to this hospital in Landstuhl, Germany, and stayed there, and they decided that I couldn't go back, right? Um, That the climate there and um, the conditions there would make it worse. And so I ended up going to Landstuhl Army Hospital, to Walter Reed Army Hospital, and then um, went home basically in December. Going back more about the leadership role that you had, how did that make you feel? Um, was, is there, was there some guilt that now you're leaving? Very. Yeah. Leaving these kids. Yeah, and in fact, that's what I was going to say. So it was quiet. Well, now you don't have to because I already said it. Well, I'm just kidding. no, but it, right after I left, there was this gunfight. Oh. with my convoy mm. um, I left in November and they got shot up in December nobody got hurt apparently. Right. Um, but I saw pictures of like the bullet holes and like people's Kevlar helmets were shot up and mm. I felt really really guilty then do you um, still talk to yeah. your unit yeah. yeah all the time yeah yeah, yeah they're good dudes um, just uh it's I'll tell you this right Um 
regardless of how you feel about the military as a place for your kid or for yourself, for um, I, for a young person, right, um, 18 to 27, okay, you learn leadership and responsibility in an environment that is high stress sometimes, um, that requires a lot of order and discipline, that relies on centuries of leadership training. And that has informed, and I'm still so far from being a good leader, but the, the, the things that I learned then, um, I use every day today. And that's what you wanted uh, yeah. from our conversation before is, yeah. is you were, you wanted that structure. That's what you were looking for. And that's what you were a little disappointed in the ROTC program that you weren't getting that, but you were, I'm assuming now you got it from, from your time in the army. It definitely taught. Yeah. The, 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 the Iraq period in the army was, um, really important and meaningful for sure well I, funny story my son-in-law who is a marine um we were at a hibachi place and the chef was cooking and out of the blue my son-in-law david says are you military and he said i i am and we're all like what and I said to David, how did you know that he was military? And he said the way that he's organizing yeah. all the food right. on the the thing. So yeah. you do learn these skills of uh, organization and structure, and which is everything you were lacking in yeah in your your childhood. Yeah, um, and being placed in charge of people, right. Um, as a, as a young person, having the weight on your shoulders of bringing people home and keeping people safe and, and keeping people, um, keeping their morale high. That's a huge thing. I'll tell you what, man, the hardest part of Iraq and Afghanistan is not the war part of it. It's not the combat. It is the psychological uh, difficulty of being separated from your family for long periods of time. Were you married at this point? Um, I was. Okay. I was. Um, we ended up getting married in court because we had planned to get married that summer, but we got married in the the day before we deployed. Wow. Yeah. There was. It was funny. A, lot, a bunch of us did, right? Just before they called us up, and then you had three days to get oh all your gosh. affairs in order, and a bunch of us who were engaged went to court and got married. Wow. Yeah. Um, but did you ever see the movie Jarhead? No. Did you ever see that, Nellie? No. With uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about him for a minute, and I lost my train of thought, <laughs> you, but I'm back. You had that dreamy look. Oh, that, delicious. Oh my God. Absolutely delicious. <laughs> He's actually um, coming out in a new movie that he looks phenomenal in. Really? Um, I like that, too. What yeah. if he did a movie with Kevin Love? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my <laughs> Molly's brain would have just spontaneously combust. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, her pants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't say shit, but we can say that. Uh, right. Nelly's a <laughs> We don't have to bird. say either one. You're a right. dirty bird. Um, no, but yes. that movie, I recommend to anybody who wants to know what it's like to be in the military because... You can see how people lose their minds in combat, not from the combat, but mm. from the paranoia and the, um, you know, paranoid about what your girl is doing back home. Right. And being in close quarters with the same group of people for a year who are totally different than you, mm -hmm. who you would never hang out with right. back home. Right. Right. There is this stress that comes from that. I remember when we were over there, there would there would be people that we had to separate them from their weapons because they would just like say afraid. things. They, they yeah, they would blurt stuff out wow. that made us think that they were not they should not have an M16. And is that your call as the as the platoon yeah. leader? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a whole process then that has to happen and And, and do and, they then get set home? Do they get um, counseling there? Do counseling. They, okay. Yeah. There. It, it goes up the chain. And then at some point, somebody else makes the call of whether to send them okay. home. 
But that stress is really meaningful and really heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, that's why you always like um, you always, you know how you always hear about people who want to go back mm -hmm. and who want to see action, right? Um, there is a high that you get from actually going into combat because it breaks that ennui. It breaks that um, that boredom, mm -hmm. you know, and the stress from living in those conditions, right? It just it's suddenly like. You know, this is exciting. This is freedom. This is what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. And that turns into a rush and into a high that people really want to taste again. And then they come back to the States, right? And they have a hard time adjusting and they remember that high. Right. They remember how great it felt to go on a mission where they were on edge and their adrenaline was going, you know? Um, and do you, or not you, but... You know, does a lot of the military, when they come back, do they get help? Do they s do counseling? Is there that that um, support? Yeah, yeah, like just d decompressing and, and adjustment period. And yeah. do they teach you how to readjust? So one, one thing I learned, Molly, is that there is a ton of support available, but the Army mm -hmm. does not do a good job communicating it. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that it's there. And actually, and th this is going to sound like a shameless plug, but no, Ryan but, Sears yeah. uh, uh, from the firm here, um, he just gave a presentation on veterans benefits. And it is um, amazing how much help there is to veterans, not just for PTSD and mental issues, mm -hmm. but like for starting for a business, mm -hmm. for health care, for, yeah, for anything, right? Mm -hmm. But um, they don't know it. Right. There's not, a, there's, there's, there's too many soldiers to keep track of. Right. You know, and the and the It's not like a newsletter that right, they send right. out. Right. And the bureaucracy is not efficient and mm -hmm. it doesn't get to everyone. And so people fall through the cracks constantly. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I have another question. Yeah. Um, you talked a little bit about breaking the rules. I'm sure that didn't come into play in the army. I'm sure breaking the rules was you not a You know how it did? Tell you know me. how it did? There's a great I think it's a great example of it. And I think that Ryan told me I should have been court-martialed for it. So two things, right? You One, sure you want this recorded? I was going to say, is there a time of... I feel like it's too late. What's that law word? Statue of limitations. Yeah, is there a statute of limitations? The right person to ask. Yeah, that. right? <laughs> uh, I think I'm okay with it. Okay. okay. All right. So two things happened that I'm very proud of that I did in the army, but which at the time were a blatant violation of rules. One was the army ran out of training ammo, right? So training ammo is, um, it's bullets that you put into your magazine, into the M16, and they sound just like regular ammo, but they don't fire. And then they, there's this uh, red thing that you um, twist onto the end of your barrel to prevent anything from coming out, right? And so, that training ammo they ran out of while we were in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And the rule apparently is that you cannot go to the private sector and ask for help. You can't ask for donations, right? They don't want the bad PR associated with that. So we were, um, I called um, this paintball company in Detroit, Michigan and told them that we wanted to use their paintball gear for um, training. And they brought down this giant truck, outfitted all 160 soldiers in our unit um, with paintball, unlimited paintball. And we had this like real life war game in the woods doing paintball all day long. It was amazing. And, we, and they brought in all this press. And um, like in the paintball world, there's a lot of, you know, journals and news and stuff. And they brought them all down. And God bless them. They were so good. But I've since learned that that was a court martialable offense. Oh. Yeah. So that happened. And then the other thing that um, was... Although, in your defense, yeah. I think that a paintball war where you actually can tell if you've hit somebody or not is probably more... Realistic. Realistic yeah. and helps with aim and stuff than a blank would be... I mean, it sounds like right. it, but I don't know if I hit you or not because and, I can't. And they ran out of that. 
Right, right, right. I'd right. like to think that they Not that better... I'm speaking against the United States Army at all. Yeah. Uh, at all. Let's get that yeah. down. I'd like to think that that helped the um, soldiers get better training. I agree. The other thing um, was I took... You know how I do a play hooky day here at the uh, at the law firm, right? Oh um, boy, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> we, did you do a play hooky in the United States Army? Yeah, we well we went um, off base in '03 um, fr- in Iraq to this um, to this beach, right? And it was right next to this Navy base, but outside the wire, and we had the best time. And we posted security up at the top of this this cliff. And we just went swimming. The joke was on me because I lost my dog tags on that. Mm. Right? And they, they've got my social security number on them. They say Jewish on it. Right? Oh. It was like, so I was the schmuck after all. But my soldiers loved it. We had the best time. We got and great I'm sure pictures. that built um, that com- camaraderie, camaraderie yeah. after yeah. that. Um, so U.S. Army, how long did you serve then? Well, so... If you count ROTC, it was 93 to 03, so 10 years. Okay. If you don't count ROTC, then it would have been six years. Okay. And then... Um, and then full-fledged, did you did you um, pass your bar the first time? Mm-hmm. I did. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. And then I went to... Uh, went to Cleveland Marshall. I did. And then... Um, I went to work for a law firm called Retzel & Andrus. Did that for two years. Worked for another one called Kalfi Halters and Griswold for another couple of years, and then and I from was, the Griswold family. That's right. Chevy Chase was there. <laughs> we uh, we went to Wally World once a year <laughs> on your on your uh, play hooky play days. hooky day. Uh huh. Um, uh-huh. Uh, did litigation there. Two, those are two really good law firms. Really, really good law firms, and Kalfi uh, actually. I had just started there when I deployed to Iraq, and they matched my salary. Wow! Because they, because I was going to take a giant pay cut, right? And I, I was married, and and they were really um, supportive. And I still remember I came back at the end of That's the year. That's another thank you letter you need to write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were really good people over there, and um, I came back. I, I remember, and I, I was I was always writing letters to them from Iraq. And I came back, and it was their holiday party. And, uh, man, it was like this giant standing ovation. Right when I came in, it was at the Cleveland Athletic Club. And uh, it was I was, like, crying like a little baby girl. It was, it was really cool. It's okay if baby, baby boys, boys cry, cry, too. too. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, we know that you have a law firm, very successful. What do you want to see out of your law firm? What do you want to see in five mm-hmm. years um, out of this law firm. She is good. She's so good. She's so good. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. And then uh, maybe lightning rounds. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, here. So, like I said, I want to build the law firm that I used to want to work for and the one that I used to want to hire when I was the client. So, after Calfee, I went to Broadvox where I was a general counsel, in-house counsel. And when you're in-house counsel, you are responsible for hiring outside lawyers, right? So... I did all their litigation and I did a bunch of corporate work, but there was a lot of stuff like patents and you know, creditors' rights. And there's a lot of practice areas that I just couldn't handle because um, I didn't have the expertise. So I would hire Calfi or other law firms, right? And there's, one, and there, there's a lot you learn from the client's perspective when, you're, when you have worn both hats, right, as outside counsel and in-house counsel. That you don't, you you really, I don't think ever get unless you've worn both hats. And so, and one of them is the importance of budgets and planning. And I always tell my lawyers here, um, you, our clients here have people that they answer to, right? Whether it's their employees or their boards or their CEOs or their wives or their husbands, right? Our client is not just a person or a company. It's a group of people who, if we don't get them the best result under budget, there is a ripple effect there too. Um, and I, the the most um, visceral 
ex- example of that is when you have when you're in-house counsel and you have to explain to your CEO why your outside counsel went over budget it feels like you're getting punched in the gut because his question to you is well aren't you my lawyer mm-hmm. aren't you supposed to keep them at budget right, right. Um, or it's well why didn't you prevent this lawsuit from happening in the first place? Weren't you watching? Exactly. Or, yeah, right, exactly. Right. And that's a question that everyone asks. And, and what I know now is that every piece of business litigation is totally preventable, right? In almost every case. Some cases it's not, I guess. But in almost every case it's preventable. And when you don't prevent it, people feel pain, right? I don't know if you guys have been sued before. But I'll tell you, you're shaking. No, right. thanks to yeah. the the Gertzberg law firm, That's I right. have it. Yeah, I think thanks to you. Yeah, right. So here, <laughs> people that have been sued, they've felt pain, right? Um, you um, get thrown into this world of uncertainty, uh, which is the court system. You are on this taxi cab ride through this the streets of some town that you um, have no clue how to get out of, and you're in the hands of some taxi driver that you just are trusting is going to get you there. That's what being in a lawsuit is like. It is um, unpredictable. It's expensive. It's distracting. It's time-consuming. And at the end of the day, if he doesn't get you there, tough shit. I mean, right. because He's he paid. walks away and yeah. right, he gets right. paid. and Yeah. Meanwhile, there are court pleadings that are getting filed that are totally defaming you. And there's nothing you can do about it because the filers have an almost absolute privilege to say anything they want in court. Right. Um, so I I know this and I'm thinking to myself that if I can take my experiences as outside counsel and in-house counsel and create a framework for our clients to avoid those lawsuits and avoid attorney general investigations and avoid bad PR and avoid all the pain and discomfort that comes from getting sued or investigated, um, that's what we're doing. We spend a lot of time auditing our clients, right? Um, so it's a long-winded way of answering your question, where do I want to see this law firm in five years? I want to change the way law firms and business clients do business. I would much rather be um, paid to um, help clients stay out of court than to get them out of court when they're already in it. Because when they're already in it, they are vulnerable, and they're paying me more than they could, more than they would have before. If they just want to, would have hired you to audit and. And, and they're paying me um, to help them with a, fo- a a narrow issue, right? Which is the issue that they're getting sued for. When you're being proactive, and you're auditing the company, and you're auditing their contracts and their insurance policies and their employment practices, you're looking at everything holistically. And now, I mean, there's things, Molly, like. Um, there's an easy way. This is a good segue, actually, because wh- wh- when you ask me later what I want, what I want, what we're working Maybe on. Maybe I changed my lightning round question. Well, here I will tell you this, right? Um, there is a really, like, the most effective way to stay out of court for a business is to put into your contracts really good dispute resolution provisions, terms that say that before you, the customer, sues me. You have to come into a room with me face to face and try to resolve your dispute with me. And if that fails, we go to mediation. And if that fails, we go to arbitration. That waterfall mechanism is, is now all. Now they're not taking you right to court. You're, you're not. You're almost guaranteed to Over. settle before you go to court. That sounds like a really great legal tip. That is a good legal tip. That's Thank a great you. legal tip. Yeah. Um, so th- that is things like that, right, are what we focus on now more. We still go to court. We we love going to court, but we our clients don't love Because you have it. to pay Nellie the big bucks. Well, right. So we need some of those people. Yeah. Clients don't love court. We no. love court. Right. We love getting our clients away from court. Right. So that's where I see the law firm. So guess what, Alex Kurtzberg? Is it lightning round? It's time oh for the lightning goodness. round. Oh, my goodness. This is so exciting. Alex Kurtzberg, what's your biggest success? You would think I would have prepared for this. It is your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
other than having me as your friend. And you're not allowed to say and children. And Nellie is your sister. I think it would be this law firm. You're not allowed to say your wife or your, or your children. Really? <laughs> uh, I, because, I, in light of that, I will say it's this law firm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, because it is uh, – it is um, – because there are 11 people that work here, and... Do you feel like the platoon leader here? Kind of, kind of. Um, but I really believe in our goals, and I really believe that our goals will um, make people happier, not just here, but outside of the firm, and being able to help them live happier lives. So like, for example, um, a lot of law firms have uh, billable hour requirements, right? 1,800 hours uh, to make a partner, 2,000 hours to get a bonus, uh, whatever, you know? Um, here we have no billable hour requirement, right? Um, because I don't want people to uh, feel like they work in a sweatshop. Will a person ever, ever be able to be partner here then? Yeah, Will that that's the be goal. Based on merit. No, in fact, um, it, it is entirely based on merit. But it's but the goal is to um, let even the younger guys make partner after just a few years. Um, and do you feel like you, because you hand select these attorneys, do you feel like you're hand selecting them to weaknesses of yours? You know, because you were talking mm. about the we were talking mm. about the last place where you hired place. I couldn't remember if it was the attorneys or that you weren't good at, at patenting, so you yeah, right. hire someone that's good um, at patent. Do you feel like you're making a very well-rounded different expertise here? I, I think so. I think so. I, I, we definitely have now lawyers whose practice areas cover 80% of what businesses need. Um, you know, M and A transactions, commercial transactions, litigation, criminal law. Now, um, so we we've we've got it all pretty well covered. And whatever we don't have covered, we bring in lawyers when we need them. Biggest failure. Um, hmm. Get deep. Well. <laughs> Now's not the time. <laughs> uh, you can't say. Uh, We're going to tell you what you can say and what you can't say. <laughs> can, you, can you guys just answer the question <laughs> yeah. for me? I don't want to. I don't know how to define failure. You can't say that one. Oh, he's not. He, he was asked to decide which one. I thought your biggest success would have been seeing so many fish shows. Did that come Ooh. up at all? You know, it did not. I've seen it, like 200 fish And shows. here's I the deal with have. that. It's because I don't know anything about fish, so I wouldn't be able to bring anything to the... I mean, other than I'll saying... cut in a little trick. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're a big Especially fish fan. Yeah. Almost 200. 200. Yeah. Like. Nellie and I have together seen a few of them. True. All over the country. Is there Molly, a, you gotta go. No. Is there an outfit that one wears to a fish <laughs> concert? Like you've got... <laughs> Uh, Jerry Garcia, we all wear tie, not we, people wear tie-dye. You've got um, Jimmy Buffett, people wear the shark head. What, what's the fish, what's the fish, what do I look like? What's my wardrobe when I go see a fish concert? I think a tie-dye is appropriate. Okay. But I think it's appropriate everywhere. That's true, you do. <laughs> so it's hippie, well, um, I, I, I. It's quit. comfort. Comfort. That's right. You should be comfortable. Yeah. Usually you'll see a lot of uh, people in like cargo shorts or like corduroy pants uh, and T-shirts. Okay. Right? Hey, Molly, you got to go. You got to go. Yeah. The next, the no, next we'll opportunity. We'll, ta- we'll tell her we're taking her to the park. <laughs> It'll be like uh, taking your dog to the vet. Right. <laughs> taking your dog to the farm. <laughs> I'm really sorry I interrupted the biggest failure question. Yeah, I bought you a little a time pause. though. Yeah. Take a pause. So, Alex, what's the biggest failure, your biggest failure? Well, um, I think that my biggest professional failure is that um, there, uh, it, it, 
there were there were folks that have left this firm that um, I could have held on to a little bit better, and I didn't manage that. That I I, I learned a lot. I've I've run this firm now for almost five years, and um, uh, people have come and gone, and there have definitely been folks who left. Um, there's folks that I fired and who I'm glad that I fired, but there's folks that left that I should have done a better job holding on to. Mm. And um, they were good people. And I, I think about how much farther along this firm could be, you know, but I don't, I don't, th that's probably the wrong way to look at it. I, I, I look at that as a great learning experience I try hard not to look at it as what I just said, which is how far along this firm would be, because that's more along the lines of regret. Right, you're not dwelling over yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes but I But you involunt... would have done something different. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes involuntarily dwell on it, um, and that's something I work on every day, right? Not just that, but, like, other failures, you know? Right. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it's probably just, like, personnel... Um, related, whether it was, you know, a better way to say it is like there, there are relationships that I think I could have done better with in my life, whether it's professional or family or whatever, um, that I um, would consider to be failures in the sense that um, I think that if I would have done things differently, I would have still had them in my life, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then, um, only because I know your mother, so I know how you're going to answer this, but um, an influential mother woman in your life. <laughs> mother woman? <laughs> <laughs> you mother woman. Oh, there's no swearing. Um, hmm. And you don't have to say your mother. <laughs> You could say your wife. I don't think she listens anyway. It's okay. She'll listen to this one. Will she? <laughs> yeah. We'll tag her in it. So after her. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Now I'm going to stick with mom on this. <laughs> no, she's a good one. Yeah, Nellie will tell Absolutely. you. We got a great she mom. She's so lovely. I mean, yeah. if you think well, it, it was her relationship with her sister that is why we're all sitting at the table right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. And... Uh, you know, love it, of family, I should say. Yeah, well, and two, like the, the things, um, there's a lot today that I attribute to her. Nellie, tell me if you, uh, if you glean similar things from your relationship with mom, but like um, I was in the theater because of mom, and I went to the theater all the time because of mom, and now I go to the theater all the time, which, by the way, I want, I want to talk to you. You're going tonight? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that. I saw it on Broadway. Oh, you did? Did you mm -hmm. like it? My friend was in it. Do you like and Broadway, it? Yeah. That's uh, American in it Paris. Was, it was it was good. It was good. It's a lot of ballet. Oh my god. It was it's, vomiting ballet. Yes, yes. I went on Thursday. It was like too it was too much. I ballet. have a little bit of a headache and I'm half tempted to say, gosh, could I sell my tickets in the next two Dude, hours? Dude, it was it was more ballet than yeah. I think I, I was expecting. Yeah. But anyway, in general, um, I love theater. I love musical right. theater in particular. And that is a direct uh, result of of my mom no but but growing up you guys didn't have a lot of money did you guys still do yeah still? i don't know how they pulled that off yeah but yeah that's so that cool. and then like um create like i feel like i got a lot of creativity from her and um she's a hip chick she is I'm not gonna she lie. she would she used to tell the best stories right like um to a kid i mean um and uh i remember like she would walk me to school and um she would just it, it was like lord of the rings every day you know um so i would attribute a lot of the creativity that i have uh to her she would want to remind you how many times she took us to the library growing yes. up yes oh totally oh. you're right well then you can attribute your book fetish yeah to her yeah i don't think she would want to hear it that way but <laughs> My love of books, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I think no, I'm going to stick with book fetish. But that's <laughs> that's a different part of the library for you, Molly. <laughs> uh, uh, is the library yeah. still open? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think so. So, um, Alex Gertzberg. Yes. I would like to know an embarrassing story that 
nobody knows of you. And here's the deal. Mm -hmm. If you don't fess up, I the whole back of this piece of paper is embarrassing stories that your sister gave me. Is that true? Yes. That's not true. Yes, it is. But we'll let you pick which one. But we're going to let you pick. And it better be good because I've got good ones. Um, have I told you guys about the time that Bobby Atchison uh, pulled my underwear off in front of yes, this? Yes, we already heard that one. one. In front of the girl, yes. Yeah. So did our podcast listeners. Yeah. Mm. Um, That's an easy go-to one. Dig deeper. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I got mean, a lot. It seems like everyone goes to the time they poop their pants. I don't want to... <laughs> Because there were those times, too, but I don't want That's not. That's cliche. That's old hat now. Well, uh, unless it's different than the others. Right. I was, I was so young, Maybe you weren't too. on the Broadway stage at that point. <laughs> He's a legend. Oh, yeah. oh here He's we go. Got well, one. This one a lot of people know about that were there when it happened. But not our listeners. Mm -hmm. Right. Not me. All right. Fifth grade. Well, let me see if I have it on my paper. Is this the spelling bee? Is that in there? Maybe. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dude, this is one of the most traumatic experiences of my entire life. Well, we'd love to hear about it. <laughs> All right. I feel like you've told us, though, but Have go I? ahead until, I, until it clicks. All right. I was a great speller, right? I was one of the best spellers. I consistently won the spelling bee every single year. And this one year in fifth grade, and after you get to a certain point, it's a, it's a school-wide assembly. The whole school is there, right? Could you pause for a minute? I just wish that everyone could see Alex's face right now because he is so excited about talking about his spelling bee. I this love is, it I'm, so much. I'm, Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm exercising demons here. Oh, you're here. That's so why. excited. Oh, my goodness. Very proud. This is Go not, ahead. No, there's nothing proud about this story, I promise you. This is... This but is you just were, failure. I'm just saying. This should have been my be biggest failure story, actually. Very proud to be the best mm. speller. Go for no, it. No, I was the best speller before this <laughs> happened. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So um, I'm up on the stage with all of the other competitors, and the spelling bee starts. And the first, like, five kids go, and they're all easy words. And now it's my turn, right? I'm, like, number six. And they call me up, and... Uh, so it's my first word, and the word is Jeep, <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to be easy. <laughs> and with a really cocky and arrogant oh, no. <laughs> expression on my face, I blurt out G-E-E-P. <laughs> oh, no. Right? Oh, and you could hear Jeep. Sure. you could hear a pin drop. In this, oh in this assembly. So did you know you were wrong? Well, here. So then I turn around to go sit back down. And <laughs> uh, like... then I hear, then I hear, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and she said, um, please exit the stage. <laughs> right? And I, I just didn't get it. Like, I really couldn't. <laughs> And As you were holding the legs of the teacher. It was just, it was like mortifying. And then I think somebody had to tell me that I spelled Jeep <laughs> wrong. So my fifth grade class was at the back of the assembly hall, right? The back of the gym. So I had to like snake my way through all of the other students with my head Excuse held. Me, pardon me? Excuse me? Oh, pardon God. Me? My head down, tail between my legs. And I go up there and everyone is quiet. Just, I mean, it was so quiet. And I get back and I sit down. And every, like, every once, with every step, I kind of heard a little bit of whispering. And, you know, <laughs> I kind of heard, he like, one of these. I heard, <gasps> like that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so then, right, I'm in class later that day. And I just want to crawl into a hole <laughs> and die. Right? And... Suddenly, people start calling me Geep Boy. <laughs> right? Like, what's up, Geep? <laughs> Including Mr. Hazelton, oh, my fifth no. grade teacher. No. Yeah. Well, you oh, never spelled it wrong again after he's that. He's a bully. Man. Okay, so a lot of things are making sense to me right now, and let me share. <laughs> <laughs> you know how when people are bullying you and it's typically a person who's going through their own stuff or I'm making fun of you because you're you're skinny but it's because I truly am feeling not skinny okay this is why 
<laughs> Alex Kurtzberg makes fun of the le- <gasps> leprosy. The leprosy. Oh. <laughs> because no, it's his no. own oh, issue. It's uh, it's not about me. It's about Alex's own issue. I will tell issue. you, an email went out just this morning <laughs> to everyone in the office Saying it's so important that all of your emails going out. No typos. No typos. And did he get use this my grammar as an app. example. <laughs> no, but you know, earlier when I asked you if you use Outlook, yes, that's because I wanted to forward you the email because there's a spell check function in your Outlook emails now that will check it. Now we know what this all stems from. I always, no, I no. always check I got, it, but it's usually not. You do not always check. I it. always check. Baloney. I do. I do. All right. It's all right. I'm good at what I do. Okay. Well, thank you, Alice Grisberg, for oh, sharing the day with us. It's been lovely. lovely. Wonderful. And thank you for uh, joining us, Nellie. Thank you, Nellie Grisberg, Selby. Thanks for letting me pop in. Absolutely. What's everybody working on? Anytime. What are you looking forward to? Yeah. What's, Molly? Um, you know, I worry we are in golf, golf yes. mode. Golf mold, mold. July 19th is our golf outing. I think we only have like three or four foursomes left. Will definitely sell out. Uh, we're that's up the Chagrin like Valley five Chamber brand from last year. So, so when this comes out, that might be next week. Yeah, all the proceeds go away. to our scholarships. It's our only fundraiser for the year, and it's um, we've got some great silent auction or live auction items this year, and uh, super pumped about. It. It's a great day to find out more. Day. Would that be cvcc.org? Click on the little golfer. What about you, Alex? What's going on with you? Well, um, as you know, we are going to start a little side podcast. Yes. That is yes. intended to keep businesses out of court. Yes. Very exciting. Yeah. So it's going to be like five Maybe minutes. Maybe I should sponsor that. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Uh, no, but the thing of it is, we're trying to come up with a name for it. Oh, yes. And... <clears throat> I think we're going to crowdsource the name of this podcast. I think we're going to have the audience vote on the best name. because You could do, um, on Facebook, you could yeah. do a voting. Yeah, we're going to release a um, snippet of the, or probably it's only five minutes. We'll probably release. Five the, to ten minutes. Yeah. Be honest. Yeah, the podcast will come out, and then uh, we will be looking for names, creative names for the podcast. because. Mm. This has been a struggle. We've got we've had a, a lot of really good ideas. Each have had their own pros and cons, and some are a little too controversial. So I'm staying away from them. So but, maybe any listeners of bed po- best podcast ever, yes, who also have an interest in uh, keeping their business out of court, yes, they should be on the lookout and be part of this process. Yes, mm-hmm. definitely yes. be on the lookout. All 50 million listeners. We'll announce it to the audience right. of best podcast ever. How about you, Nellie? Are you working on anything interesting? Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, we have a nonprofit seminar you're working on. That's true. That's coming up. Well, and this concert series is still going on. Oh, it yeah. certainly is. And I really enjoy those. And mm. how about the cancellation last week? But no panic, everybody. Yeah. We have booked them for August 7th. The Diamond Project yes. was rained out. Yes, it but was. But that just means that we get to see them one and a half times. Because that was half and that of was the show. that was the first time ever, that, at least through my, am I in administration? <laughs> my, yeah. The Kevler um, administration. Yes. <laughs> um, that, that we started, and then it started pouring, and we had to stop. Like, I had... Uh, no idea, but they are coming back, and, uh, and that was probably, and you're probably happy that it did, because that was our largest crowd. Really? That mm. hit, yeah, it was wow. a great crowd, great crowd. So mm. we'll, well, it's nice we'll that's have back. them back. Yeah, every Another Tuesday and Thursday. Pop-Tarts this Thursday, but that's not going to matter. Why isn't no? it going to matter? Is it coming out? Because, oh. yeah. Well, people should also go to cvcc.org mm-hmm. to see the, the whole schedule schedule's up there. for the whole summer. Yes. Right, because the Gertzberg Law Firm is sponsoring the entire summer concert series. The whole series. series. And think, now an yeah. additional one. Right. Very exciting. All That's 18 concerts in all. Wow. It's a lot yeah. of music. It's a lot, it's a lot of good I love times. outdoor music. It's, you know what, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing better. I don't know if right. you guys were... Um, able to see a, uh, I did a voice over for a video about Chagrin Falls. I don't know if anybody got to see it, although 
18,000 people got to see it in three days, but you know, who's judging? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but it, it was the it, talking about sitting there and then having yeah. the horse and buggy, and, yeah. you know, walk by and, and you're sitting on your blanket with your family. I mean, there's, there's nothing, nothing like it. Agreed. Nothing like it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks all. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. That was uh, fun and lovely. Day. Take yes. care, everybody. See ya. Enjoy. Uh, this will be the first yeah. episode with our, no, the second episode with our new intro by Larry oh. Morrow. Oh, nice. That's exciting. Who would be the first one? Katie's. Katie's. Okay, yeah. But it's the same theme music. So at this point, listeners, enjoy the good old theme music we've always had. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Later, dudes. Thank See you for ya. listening. Bye.